video for chapter 5, section 1, right? So the first section in chapter 5. Chapter 5, we're going to be talking about integration. Right? Um, they poetically put it as the language of accumulation, whatever that means. Okay, so 5.1. 5.1 is about anti-differentiation, taking anti-derivatives. Uh, and the indefinite integral. So we'll figure out what all those words mean. Um, we'll talk about the antiderivative, which uh, you can also interchange the word integral, right? So an antiderivative and integral, those are the same thing. Uh, the the antiderivative or integral of a function, talk about some common integrals and properties of integration, right? So integration would be taking integrals in the same way derivation is taking derivatives, something like that. Okay, so let's start with what is an antiderivative, right? So first off, what do you think it might be, right? So we've spent a while talking about derivatives. So maybe an antiderivative is going backwards, right? So we'll, we'll be thinking of things like this. So let's say uh, I'm going to look at 2x, right? So what function can you think of that has derivative 2x? I'll give you a second. All right, so I think the most common thing people would come up with is x squared. All right, so if, if f of x is x squared, then f, the derivative of f, f prime, is 2x. All right, so there's one. Are there more than one? I'll give you a second to think about that. Can you think of another function whose derivative is 2x? What about x squared plus 1? Oops. Plus 1. What's the derivative of x squared plus 1? Well, it's 2x. What about x squared plus 2? It also has derivative 2x. x squared plus 30 also has derivative 2x. All right, so x squared plus any constant number, x squared plus any number, plus a constant, however you want to say that, has derivative 2x. This is what we mean by taking antiderivatives or integrals, right? The idea of anti-differentiation or integration. So we're going to look at something and try to figure out... Okay, so here's the formal definition, right? So we say that this little f is the... Der if the little f is the derivative of capital F, what that means is that capital F prime is little f, then we say that that capital F is an antiderivative or integral or indefinite integral, whatever that means, of f of x. All right, so if you take the derivative of capital F and get little f, then capital F is an antiderivative of little f. So it's just going the opposite direction. Instead of taking a derivative, we're going to take an antiderivative and go backwards and say, that if I start with little f and go backwards, I get the antiderivative f of x. So like we said before, any time uh, we were looking at 2x and we said that one antiderivative is x squared, but we could also add any constant we want to that. And so that gives us infinitely many uh, antiderivatives of a specific function, little f. But they all basically look like the main part, right, so from our example, we had a 2x, and the main part here would be something like x squared plus some constant, right? So they're all of the form f of x, capital F of x, plus a constant, where the derivative of this capital piece is what you're talking about, and then you can add whatever you want. All right, so there's infinitely many, but they all basically look the same. So if I give you a function little f of x and ask you for its antiderivative, what I'm looking for is something like this, where you give me a function of x and just say plus any constant you want. Um, we use the word indefinite integral here, and we'll talk about something called a definite integral later. All right, so let's, uh, you guys remember when we talked about derivatives, we had to introduce a bunch of notation. Here we're going to need to introduce notation uh, for taking antiderivatives, right? So a way to communicate what we're doing um, and what we mean by things. 
So this is our integral notation. All right, so take it in. There it is. And what does this mean? Well, what we have here, this reads the indefinite integral, or just the integral, or the antiderivative, that's that symbol, of f of x with respect to x is capital F of x plus c, right? So that's what we would read through that. So the, the integral of f of x dx, or the antiderivative of f with respect to x, however you want to say that, is capital F plus c. All right, and so this first symbol is called the integral sign, right? And so what that means is you want, to, it's saying take the integral, right? It's similar to the little prime notation when we took derivatives that said take the derivative, something like that. Um, uh, the function inside, right? So I think of this as being inside of here. It's called the integrand. You don't need to know that. Um, and then this d of x is called the differential. You don't really need to know that either. What you do need to know is that when these things are put together like this, what they mean is take the integral of the piece in here. Right? So this says take the integral with respect to x. So let's start doing this. Let's take some integrals. Right? So what's the integral of 8 with respect to x? The integral of 8 with respect to x. All right, we're thinking what function, when you take the derivative, do you get 8? I'll give you a second to think about that. All right, so what function, when you take the derivative, do you get 8? Well, how about 8x? Right, 8x, when you take the derivative, you get 8. So the integral of 8 with respect to x is 8x. Now, of course, just like before, I could do 8x plus 1 or 8x plus 17 trillion. It doesn't matter. And so the way we denote that you can add anything you want is you always write plus and then a capital C. And that capital C stands for constant. All right, so when we, when we write the integral of 8 with respect to x or the integral of 8 dx or the antiderivative, however, those all mean the same thing. That's the first piece here. That is 8x plus some constant. So we write it as 8x plus C. So whenever you see these antiderivatives that are indefinite integrals, Right? Again, we'll distinguish between indefinite and definite later. When we see that, we always have to add c. Let's do another example. So here we have the integral of 3x squared dx. So we want to take the antiderivative 3x squared with respect to x. So what function can you think of that has derivative 3x squared? Well, how about x cubed? Right? So when you take the derivative of x cubed with respect to x, you get 3x squared. But again, it could be x cubed plus 1, x cubed plus 7, it doesn't matter. Right? So we always have to denote that you can add any constant you like to that, and you'll still get that 3x squared as your derivative. And remember, of course, that's coming from the derivative of a constant is 0, no matter what constant it is. All right, how about, what's the integral of e to the 2x dx? All right, so we're looking for the function whose derivative is e to the 2x. Well, remember, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. So the derivative of e to the 2x would be something like 2 e to the x. But we don't want that 2 to be there. So how do we get rid of that? Well, what we're going to do is divide by that 2, right? So instead of multiplying that 2 like we did when we take the derivative, we're going to divide by that. And if you get 1 half e to the 2x, when you take the derivative of that, the the 2 in the exponent is going to come down with the chain rule and multiply by the 1 half, and it'll go away and leave you with a, a 1 sitting out front. So the antiderivative of e to the 2x is 1 half e to the 2x, and we're going to add c to that. And so again, you can add any constant you want, so we just say plus c. All right, what about 1 over x? So what function can you think of that has derivative 1 over x? Well, that's the natural log of x plus c. All right. One thing I am going to note here is that we can only plug, hopefully you remember, positive numbers into natural log. So I'm going to put an absolute value bars around here, which just says that uh, if this x, maybe if we were somewhere where this x was not positive, We'll need to make it positive. Right now, just remember that that's something you need to do 
And we'll talk about why uh, we're doing that in later sections. But it is something we have to do. So now let's just look at some common integrals, all right? Um, so the integral of a constant, that was like our integral of 8, um, is just that number times x plus c, right? So that's going backwards from taking derivatives, right? The derivative of kx is just k, so the antiderivative of k is kx plus a constant. So the integral of a constant is the constant times x plus c. All right, what about the integral of a power? So if you have the integral of x to the n dx, so that was where we looked at something maybe like that x squared guy. Remember when we took the derivative, you'd bring the n down and reduce it by 1. It would be, you know, n times x to the n minus 1. So when we're taking antiderivatives, we need to undo pulling that n down. And so that's why we divide by n plus 1. And we need to undo subtracting the 1, so we add 1. Right? So the integral of x to the n with respect to x is 1 over n plus 1 times x to the n plus 1. And then it's an indefinite. Right? So these are all just things you need to remember. Um, and uh, hopefully they'll become easy for you like taking derivatives was. Right, so uh, here's our, the integral of 1 over x is the natural log of the absolute value of x plus c. Um, if we know that x is positive, which again, we won't really be doing that for a bit. We'll need to get to our definite integrals. Uh, then you can drop absolute value bars. But if it's just an indefinite integral, if you see 1 over x, make sure you put those absolute value bars there. All right, and then our other example is the integral of e to the ax. We had a equals 2 in our example, and you always divide by that 2, right? So when we took derivatives, we multiplied by that number. So when we take antiderivatives, all we have to do is divide by it to go backwards, all right? And it's an indefinite integral, so just like the others, we have to do big plus c at the end. So now let's look at some properties of these integrals. Um, because we're undoing derivatives, these integrals have all of the same properties that derivatives did, right? Uh, if you have a constant, you can pull it out that multiplication, right? That k comes to the outside and ends up in the front, right? We could do that exact same thing with derivatives. Uh, if you have any two functions and you're adding or subtracting them, you can just do them separately, right? On the inside becomes two different integrals. And again, that's also the same thing we did with derivatives. Okay, so now let's use our properties um, and our common integrals uh, to find some more integrals. So what about the integral of x to the 7? Okay, so that looks like our x to the n guy. So for x to the n, what did we have to do? We had to raise the degree and divide by that new thing. All right, so we're undoing taking the derivative. So we're going to divide by 7 plus 1. All right, that was our rule. And we're going to raise it to the 7 plus 1. Uh-oh. So 7 plus 1, right? So remember, when we take the derivative, we subtract 1 and we multiply it down. So to undo that, we have to add 1 and divide it, right? So we get 1 over 7 plus 1 times x to the 7 plus 1. Since this is an indefinite integral, we need to do a big plus c. Right? And you can, of course, just write 7 plus 1 as 8. So it's 1 8 x to the 8 plus c. That's the antiderivative or integral of x to the 7. All right, how about something like 4 times the 6th root of x dx? Now, for this one, we're going to use our property that we can pull the 4 out. We know that's the same thing as the integral of the 6th root of x dx times 4. Right? So we can just take the integral of the 6th root of x and then multiply that whatever we get by 4. And it might help to rewrite the 6th root of x as x to the positive 1 6 dx. When we write it like that, right, then we can use our rule. So remember we always sort of rewrote roots or fractions or whatever uh, as a x to the something when we were taking derivatives. It's also very helpful when we're taking antiderivatives and trying to work backwards. So uh, once we write it in this form, we can 
use our properties. We know the four is just going to come along for the ride. Uh, and this x to the one sixth is going to become one over, and then you do the original one sixth plus one. Uh oh. Plus one, and x to the one sixth plus one. All right, so now when we have this multiplication by four, you don't have to do four times c, because that c just represents any number you want. So if you take any number you want and multiply it by four, it's still just some other number that I don't know. All right, so when you're doing these indefinite integrals, even if you're pulling out those constants, you can just tack on a big plus c at the end. All right, and if you wrote it like this, that would really be okay with me. Uh, but it's a little neater to write this as um, 4, and then that 1 6 plus 1 is 7 6. And since it's, that's, a, that's a 1 over 7 6, that becomes 4 times 6 sevenths. All right, so however you want to write that. All right, and if you need to work through that yourself, just make sure that you can write turn this into 26. Whoops, not 26. 24. 24 sevenths. Things going crazy today. 24 sevenths, x to the, and then 1 6 plus 1 is 7. How about 9 over x dx? So, remember we had our rule uh, for x to the n. But it didn't work for x equals for n equals negative one because that's something like one over x and that's a natural log, right? That's the derivative of natural log. So what we have to do here is first off, pull out your nine. And it's 9 times the integral of then you're left with a 1 over x dx. And now you should recognize that 1 over x is the derivative of natural log. So this becomes 9 natural log. And then you have to remember to do these absolute value bars. And then since it's an antiderivative or an indefinite integral, we're taking this and we're just going to add a constant to say 9 natural log of x, then plus whatever number you want will get you derivative of 9 divided by x. Um, this, as a note, I've been writing this step every time. You do not have to write that step. Um, if you go straight from this to that, that is perfect. All right, what about something like 5e to the 4x? What function has derivative 5e to the 4x? Right, so again, it might be helpful to write this as 5 times the integral of e to the 4x. So we're going to pull that constant out, just like we always did with derivatives. And again, this step is not necessary, but it could be helpful. Um, if you want to keep writing this step for a bit until you get comfortable, and then you can just uh, never write it again, that's fine. Okay, so what is that? Well, remember our rule for the derivative of e to the ax is you do divided by a, in this case a is 4. Right? So it's 1 fourth e to the 4x, and that undoes multiplying by that 4 when we took the derivative. And again, we're just going to tack on a big plus c out at the end. You don't have to do the 5 times c. Uh, if you want to write that as 5 fourths e to the 4x, that's fine. Um, this is fine as well. One thing, I'll take this time to note that notice that we stopped writing this integral symbol and this dx symbol once we actually took the antiderivative, right? Remember when we were taking derivatives, we stopped writing the symbol for the derivatives when we took the derivatives. When we were taking limits, we stopped writing the limbo, limit symbol whenever we took the limit. So same thing here. We're going to stop writing these symbols once we actually take that antiderivative, right? This is telling us 
take the integral with respect to x. Once you do that, you don't write those integral symbols. All right, here's a couple more examples. How about something like the integral of 3x to the 5 minus 7x squared plus 8 dx. Okay, so how do we do something like that? Well, remember we had a rule with derivatives that you could just take each derivative of each little term when you were adding and subtracting separately. And we showed you already that that's the same rule that we can use for integrals or antiderivatives. That we can just take the antiderivative of each little piece separately and throw it all together. Okay, so uh, I won't write that out in the gory detail of the integral of 3x to the 5th dx minus the integral of... I'm not going to do that. You can if you'd like. Um, but what you just need to know is you're just going to take the antiderivative of each term separately. So what's the antiderivative of 3x to the 5th? That's going to be 3, and then you do 5 plus 1, so the 3 over 6. x to the 5 plus 1 is 6. And then you're going to subtract the integral of 7x squared, so that would be 7 over 2 plus 1 is 3 x to the 2 plus 1, which is 3, plus, now the integral of 8, we already did that one, is 8x, whoops, Eight x, and that's the integral of each of those terms, but we have to do a plus c here. You do not have to do plus c, plus c, plus c for each term, just throw a big plus c at the end, and it'll take care of all of all of them together, right? One big plus C works. Okay, how would you do something like this? We have the integral of 4 over the square root of x plus 3 fourths e to the negative 2x minus 9 over x. So again, we're going to do each one of these individually, but it might help, like we did before, to rewrite 4 over the square root of x first. So what's 4 over the square root of x? Well, since it's in the denominator, coming to the numerator, it's going to be negative. And then a square root, we get a 1 half uh, in the exponent. So 4x to the negative 1 half. Okay, and then I'm just going to copy down the other stuff, and we're not going to change it. And that's the same thing. Notice that I kept my integral symbols, the integral with respect to x, because I've not yet taken the integral or the antiderivative. Okay, so I keep those symbols there, but now in this step I'm going to actually take the derivative, so I'm not going to write those symbols anymore. All right, so to take the derivative of something like 4x to the negative 1 half, we're going to use that x to the n rule, and once I take this derivative I don't write my symbols anymore. So we want 4 and then over negative 1 half plus 1, that is positive 1 half, and that's x to the negative 1 half plus 1. That's, again, positive 1 half. So that's the integral of the first piece, the antiderivative of the first piece. And just like before, I'm just going to add the antiderivative of the second piece, and then I'll subtract the antiderivative of the third piece. Uh, you just do them term by term. So here we've got 3 fourths. And then we do times, since it's negative 2x in the exponent, we're going to divide by negative 2, or multiply by 1 over negative 2. And then you leave the e to the negative 2x alone. If you want to combine that as negative 3 eighths, that's fine too. And then lastly, remember that negative 9 over x, we already did that guy, and it was negative 9, the natural log, right? So the 9 comes out, we look, we're looking at something like 1 over x, so that's natural log when we take the antiderivative. And don't forget those absolute value signs. All right, and then again, we're going to do a big old plus c at the end. That's going to take care of all the plus c's. You don't have to do three of them. Uh, and also, one more time, notice that I stopped writing my integral symbols, or my with respect to x, with respect to x excuse me, symbol, once I actually took that antiderivative. Uh, if you wanted to prettify this and write this as 8, you could. You'd have 8x to the 1 half. And then prettifying the second term, like I already said, uh, is negative 3 eighths x. Oops, not x. E to the negative 2x. 
and then minus 9 natural log of x. If you write it that first way, that's fine. If you write it this way, that's fine too. Um, you know, you remember, hopefully, that when we took derivatives, we always said, do not simplify. Um, for these, you don't need to simplify if you're just taking uh, an antiderivative. But here's another example that we'll see. So I say find the integral of 2x plus 3 dx, and then I say where f of 1 is negative 2. All right, so this is how your book presents this. Uh, and one important thing, excuse me, one important thing to notice is that f of x, what do they mean by that here? Well, what they mean is this integral, right? The integral of 2x plus 3 dx. All right, so what they're saying here is that we're looking at the function that is the antiderivative of this guy, and that when you plug 1 into that, it spits out a negative 2. So what, is, what does that do? How is this different? Um, well, remember, when we do these antiderivatives, we get a big plus c. When they give us something like f of 1 is negative 2, that's going to allow us to figure out what exactly c is, right? So instead of saying, oh, you could add any constant, when they give us a point like this, it's going to allow us to figure out a specific c that we care about or that we're talking about here. All right, so what we want to do is figure out what is this antiderivative. All right, so I'm going to stop writing these integral symbols because I'm going to take the antiderivative of 2x, which is x squared. All right, remember that's 1 over 2, but then there's a times 2, so that's hiding in there. Um, so we did a, there's that 2 comes along for the ride. And then we divide it by this exponent of 1, so it's a 1 plus 1 is 2. But you don't have to write that because 2 over 2 is just 1. Um, and frequently it's easier to see uh, like t the antiderivative of 2x is x squared. The antiderivative of 7x to the 6 is just x to the 7, something like that. Um, and you it's easier to see that without writing this. But that's fine too, to use the full-on rule. Uh, and then lastly, plus 3. And then, of course... Oops, 3x. Ha, didn't take the antiderivative. Needed to. The antiderivative of 3 is 3x, so there we get a big plus c. So I'm going to rewrite this just one more time without that 2 over 2. So we get x squared plus 3x plus c. And that is our function f of x that's referenced over here where we say f of 1 is negative 2. So if f of 1 is negative 2... The goal here is to write f of x, right, the long-term goal, do a bunch of stuff, and get f of x equals, but over here we don't want to have a plus c. We want to only have numbers and x's, right? So that's going to be our goal. So let's do that. But how do we do that? Well, what we're going to do is use this point, f of 1 is negative 2. So negative 2 is what we get whenever we plug 1 in for x. So that's 1 squared plus 3 times 1 plus c. So that's negative 2 is 1 plus 3. So we can subtract 1 and subtract 3 to get negative 6 equals c. So now we plug c equals negative 6 into what we had up here. And you get x squared plus 3x minus 6. And that is the antiderivative of 2x plus 3 whenever uh, f of 1 is negative 2. And so we'll do this a lot in word problems and things like that where we are given a point or an initial value or something like that that's going to allow us to actually figure out what... So this is a, one of those word problems where we're going to be given enough information to actually figure out what that C is, uh, and then we'll go from there. So we have Tucker throws her cat toy upward with an initial velocity of 25 feet per second, and from an initial height of six feet. The velocity in feet per second of the cat toy is given by V of T is minus four T plus 25, uh, or T is the number of seconds after Tucker throws the toy. It says find a function H that's gonna give us the height of the toy at time t, and then find the height and velocity of the toy after three seconds. Right, so that after three seconds is the same as saying t equals three. 
So we're going to try to find this h and then find v of 3 and h of 3. All right, well, we can find v of 3 now. All right, we don't have to do anything to do that. And that's going to answer this question of finding the velocity. And what do we get? Uh, negative 4 times 3 plus 25. That's 13 feet per second. So at time 3 seconds, the toy is moving it with velocity 13 feet per second. Okay, so how do we find a function h of t that models the height? Well, one thing to remember is that if we're given a position function, right, um, and maybe you guys don't remember this because we haven't really done it except in a couple of examples, you don't need to have remembered this, but if you have a function h that gives you a height and you take the derivative, that's going to give you a velocity. All right, so we used this example when we were talking about uh, position and we knew that Okay, if I started with a position function and I took the derivative, then that would give me my velocity. And if I took the derivative again, that would give me my acceleration. So we, we used an example similar to this when we first started taking derivatives. Um, but here, instead of me giving you a position where I am and asking you to find my speed, I'm going to give you the speed and have you tell me the position function, the height function. All right, so what we're looking for here to find h, if, if h prime is v, then h is the antiderivative of v. So we know that if we take the antiderivative, we can find h. We also know, since the initial height is 6 feet, that for this function h of t, the initial height means whenever time is 0, that's the initial height, that h of 0 is 6. So now we've got a setup where we're given a function v of t and a point, and we're going to do just what we did before, where we take the antiderivative, we use our point to figure out what c is. So what is this? Uh, this is the integral of minus 4t plus 25 dt plus, that's a plus. Let's try to clean that up a little bit. Plus. Okay, and this dt tells us we're taking the derivative with respect to t. Um, oh, sorry, we're taking the antiderivative with respect to t. So we're looking for the function h of t so that when you take the derivative with respect to t, you get this v of t. So we're going to use our rules. Try to figure out this. Pause the video if you need to uh, on your own before I show it to you. Okay, so we've got negative 4t. So t to the 1 is going to become a t squared. Negative 4 over 2 is negative 2. So we get negative 2 t squared. And then plus 25 is going to be plus 25 t. And then we do a big old plus c because we were taking an, an antiderivative, an indefinite integral. Again, notice that I stopped writing my derivative symbols, antiderivative symbols, excuse me when I actually took that integral or that antiderivative. So there's my function h of t, but when I, if I know that h of 0 is 6, that gives me, well, if I plug in 0, the t squared term goes away, the 25t term goes away, c must be 6, right? So h of 0 equals 6 gives us that 0 plus 0 plus c is 6, right? So I'll show you that step. That's 0 is for minus 2 times 0 squared. That 0 is for 25 times 0. So that was plugging in 0 to that thing, and we got c equals 6. So now we can write the honest to goodness h of t where we know what c is, and that's minus 2t squared plus 25t. Oh man. 25t and plus 6. So that's my function h of t. So here it says find a function h of t. There it is. All right, I already found my velocity at 3 seconds, but I'm also asked to find the height at 3 seconds. So what I want to do is plug 3 into this guy. That's going to tell me what height this toy is uh, at 3 seconds. 5.1, so we're just working backwards, starting with a function and finding an antiderivative instead of a derivative. And we're going to go ahead and do all the homework from this section because we're going to need a lot of practice.
And there is baby Sully. Aw, oh, so cute. So small. Okay, see you guys in class.